Time to talk the week that was in media screw-ups with friend of the show, Katie Halper, host of the Katie Halper Show and co-host of Useful Idiots. And Katie joins us now. Great to see you, Katie. Nice too. Hey, Katie. All right, so um, hey. this week we saw some uh, re-emergence of the Russiagate narrative kind of all the way around. We had developments with Flynn. We had, you know, a list of Obama-era officials unmasked. Um, Trump sort of went crazy with the Obamagate thing. Democrats melted down. What did you make of all of this, Katie? Well, I think that the most um, telling story and development is that there's been barely any coverage of what is really this bombshell um, in the latest Russiagate uh, conspiracy debunking, um, reading from uh, Aaron Mate, who's really excellent on this, uh, in newly released congressional testimony, CrowdStrike President Sean Henry said that, quote, we did not have concrete evidence, and quote, that alleged Russian hackers actually took the emails from DNC servers, quote, there's circumstantial evidence, but no evidence that they were actually exfiltrated, which is should be huge and be receiving tons of coverage because this was the justification for so much, uh, you know, uh, of the of the collusion charges and the conspiracy charges against Donald Trump and quote unquote the Russians. The fact that no one's covering this is really telling because again, this should right. be a huge deal. Well, and and to me, what it is is they these people acted the whole time from the very beginning. If you question this, you are crazy conspiracy theorists. And it turns right. out that their certainty is based on circumstantial evidence. Now, yeah, you know, I think it probably happened. But, you know, at the same time, you have to, you cannot speak down to people who have legitimate doubts in a very consequential story that has massive geopolitical implications for how we were to respond to something. And that's how they handled it. And then when it comes to this, Katie, not one word to say, right? Right. But I actually think that there's a lot of evidence. I mean, we now know from these released transcripts that a lot of the things that they claimed aren't even true. For mm -hmm. instance, um, you know, Julian Assange, even according to Mueller's timeline, Julian Assange didn't talk to Guccifer until after he released some of the WikiLeaks. So I think there are two issues. One is that there was circumstantial evidence. But the other thing is that there is actually stuff that was claimed that we know did not happen. And in terms of the conspiracy theory uh, discourse, which you uh, just uh, um, alluded to, the, the irony is that the people pushing Russiagate are the conspiracy theorists. Yes. And something else that we experience on the left that you don't, uh, Sagar, is that <laughs> not only are you called a conspiracy theorist if you question this stuff, but you're called a Trump enabler. And, uh -huh. of course, the irony is that I don't like Trump. A lot of the left obviously doesn't like Trump. But by focusing on this in particular, the media's focus on this has really undermined the resistance to Trump. In fact, I think that a lot of the reasons that a lot of the things that he did around COVID are not being as, um, you know, are not as, as shocking or disturbing or getting as much traction as they should is because the media spent so much time pushing this narrative and people were able to debunk that and roll their eyes at that, people on the right. Um, and so now I think the media has so much less cred and their criticisms, their more valid criticisms of Donald Trump are, are now weakened and undermined. Uh -huh. It's also interesting, this was a point that uh, Glenn Greenwald was making, like the Russiagate narrative on a variety of levels has also forced liberals off of like previous principled and ideologically held positions. And we yes. see that specifically with Michael Flynn and, you know, the revelations about the way the FBI basically, you know, aimed to entrap him, which is not right. like a Michael Flynn specific thing. And in another context, um, liberals would be outraged about that type of behavior and entrapment. And it shouldn't really you, your outrage should not depend on whether you happen to like the person or agree with the person who was ultimately sort of entrapped. There's that piece. There's also like an understanding that liberals and civil libertarians have around. Sometimes people plead guilty even when they don't actually think of themselves yeah, right. as guilty, right? Because yeah. of the way that the heavy hand of the government comes on and that's your best bet for a decent deal and for a decent shake. And so you plead guilty. And so that like previous principled ideological understanding has been tossed out the window simply because you don't like, I mean, I don't like Michael Flynn's politics either, right? But that right. shouldn't matter in terms of application of the principle. Yeah, this is should be a bedrock principle for liberals, right? Um, due process, um, uh, the, you know, the idea that the intelligence community often does things that we find to be problematic 
this has gone out the window because of Donald Trump and Russiagate. And of course, it's extremely dangerous because we should not be lionizing the intelligence community, the same intelligence community that has done so many things that liberals typically and historically have found to be unsavory and including entrapment, like you just said, Crystal. And, you know, what I'm really annoyed about is as someone who's a leftist, I would really rather not spend my time defending Michael Flynn. Not that I'm <laughs> defending him ideologically, but why are we talking about this? There's so much to go after with the Trump administration. And this is not just like, do I have a moral problem with this, an ethical problem with this? And as you said, you know, this is just basic a ACLU stuff. You don't have to be kind of like a Bernie crat or a leftist right. to find this bad. But in addition to that, it's just on a strategic level, it's so stupid because all it does is undermines the actual resistance to Trump, furthers a MIC resistance to Trump, um, which only enables him because this is such a great narrative for Trump, who has said from the beginning that the media was going after him unfairly. And they are. And again, I'd really rather not spend my time kind of and not that I'm defending Trump or Flynn on ideological grounds again. And there's so much I would criticize Trump for. But. It's actually a major disservice to um, critic to to the movement against Trump to be pushing this of all things. And Matthew yes. Haidi said early on in an interview I did with him um, on the on the Katie Halper show before we started doing Useful Idiots is that there were so many ways that the media and that the Democrats could go after Trump, like so many potential ways to do that, and they did the one thing that totally um, walked into his trap, that totally helped him and made him seem extremely prescient and credible. Yeah, Just that's a great point. And, and you know, geez. another key part of the media narrative, of, aside from ignoring what has happened here, Katie, is also been their own complicity in hiring the central figures in this story, one of whom is James Clapper. And you rightfully point to CNN contributor Clapper, former director of national intelligence, who spread outrageous lies on their network for two years, proven to be completely wrong when the Mueller report and all this and the transcripts and all that come out. Well, here he is once again, as you point out, in a new clip that we that surfaced from CNN in which he's basically being fed talking points yeah. um, from the beginning about why exactly whatever he may or may not have done is completely wrong, apparently right. Let's take a listen to that. Legal, correct? Uh, if you, uh, if, if it involves classified information, absolutely. Um, David Ignatius put out this famous column on January 12th where he mentioned the phone call between Michael Flynn, the, uh, the December 29th phone call. Did you leak that information? I did not. Okay, good. Then, then again, and I was just talking to Jeffrey Tubin about the idea of immunity here. One of the things you're actually looking into, it, people suggest, how can you be spying or looking at a member of the Trump transition? In fact, you would be even more concerned if it were an active member of the administration, the Obama administration. Sometimes you want to know if current administration officials are talking in ways with other governments. Well, absolutely. I mean, one of the concerns you have is, particularly with Russians, most of whom are going to be connected with, with the government, is that if there is engagements with, their, with, with them, is there recruiting? What, what did you make of that, Katie? What did you make of that whole well, thing? So the first clip is actually, I got excited. It looked like the mm. CNN anchor was actually asking some questions that were somewhat adversarial um, and challenging. But then we had this like either tech fail or yeah, rage right. quit as some people have called it online. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and then he gets back on and that's when the CNN anchor really says things that make it apparent that he's just trying to exonerate him um, and, and feed him lines that help him, including for instance, like, oh, you should have been upset about the, if anything, it was, it was your, the administration, the outgoing administration. And he mm -hmm. just uses these totally, the language that the clapper uses is just, you know, such red baiting Russia gate, uh, you know, fear mongering the Russians, this, the Russians that, and, um, yeah. And I, I think what happened is like, not to be too conspiratorial, like, okay, to be totally unconspiratorial, let's say there was a tech issue. But it, mm -hmm. it does look a little bit like the Luke Harding phenomenon where Aaron Mate asked him for a single piece of evidence of collusion because the guy had written a book called Collusion and he hangs up on Aaron. So, <laughs> you know, it does remind me of that a little Great. bit. Who knows? Who yeah. knows? Um, but, well, but definitely, and yeah. And that's the whole thing that Sagar points to is like, you know, people like Clapper were brought in 
there was an assumption that they, you know, couldn't divulge everything, but kind of really knew what was going on because of the positions that they previously held. And so when they made these statements alluding to like, oh, there's a there's another shoe to drop and oh, there's a lot more here than meets the eye. People understandably really believe them um, because of the previous positions. You you assume they have access to way more intelligence. They probably know the full extent that maybe isn't really in public view. So when they were like, this is just the tip of the iceberg, it lent a lot of credibility to the narrative. And there's never been a reckoning over that. No. No, not at all. I mean, again, you'd think that this CrowdStrike story would be huge and embarrassing, uh, but no one's talking about it. Yeah, except for us. Well, Katie, thanks for yeah. joining us. Always Appreciate great to see it. you, Katie. Thank you. Great. Bye. And we'll have more rising for you after this.